Good button. Good afternoon. Welcome to the PET uh, cardio respiratory system. Here we're talking about the heart and lungs this afternoon. Um, so just quick uh, communications check. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can see and hear me, if you haven't already, that is. I know some of you in the room early. Thumbs up in the chat if you can see and hear. Fantastic. Okay, so everything is working as it should. Um, I don't know whether you saw the announcement that I've released another ebook. Um, this one is about the principles of exercise therapy. So um, it's about why we start with principles and what each principle um, entails, really. Some of you asking me about what books to read. Um, th there's no book out there, to my knowledge, that covers these subjects in the detail um, that I've done here. So I've had to write the ebooks myself um, because they're the ones used for the exam. So if you follow my ebooks, they're the best way of doing stuff. And then you can obviously read around the topic, listen to podcasts, um, and uh, read the literature, so on and so forth. Okay, Any, um, just give me a thumbs up in the chat if you've even had a look um, at the Principles of Exercise Therapy new ebook. Has anyone looked at that? Anyone? Yeah, Claire's looked at it. Anyone else? Just, just you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you for that. At least there's one of you. Right. So we will crack on and talk in, talking about the cardiorespiratory system. On Monday, you're going to be doing <coughs> the step-up test and uh, the Tabata test. Um, we're going to be doing squats and press-ups. There are re um, regression exercises if you want in there, but make sure you bring your <coughs> your sports kit on Monday um, because you, you're potentially going to be getting hot and sweaty. Obviously, you've got an injury. You don't have to do it, but we'd like you to try and participate. Uh, so look forward to Monday. So a little reminder about, you know, you've just come from wherever you've come from doing whatever. For the next hour, we focus on physiotherapy. We focus on human anatomy and physiology, human movement and function, maximizing wellness and potential, minimizing disease and injury, and my goodness me, have we got some real world problems to solve at the moment, uh, particularly with things like long COVID. So physiotherapists um, really in demand at the moment. Um, so today, what should we be covering? We're covering how exercise affects the heart and the lungs, also known as the respiratory system or the cardiovascular system, if we're talking about the blood vessels. Um, we're going to talk about how do we measure um, exercise exertion. Um, and what exercise exertion is right for the individual, and also the concept of something called prevent and provoke. We prevent long-term um, heart conditions and, and medical problems by provoking short-term. Yeah, prevent and provoke. Um, so that potentially might be a question that you might be asked in the future, worth remembering that. Okay, we've got the Asport Billy which is the principles of exercise therapy and obviously the new ebook that I've just written that will discuss the, all these principles in detail. With regard to the, we're talking about adaptation and the physiology behind that. We're also talking about kind of behavior change and lifestyle integration at the same time. It's no good just pres uh, prescribing exercise um, if we haven't got the backing uh, of the patient. If the patient hasn't bought into those exercises, they're just not going to do them. So, uh, yeah, worth always revising um, the principles. And then we're talking about what we call the exercise paradox. So if I said to you, what is the exercise paradox? The exercise paradox is exercise is hard work. It gets you out of breath, gets you sweaty, gets the heart rate up. So it provokes you short term in order to prevent conditions long term. And this will be with the cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory adaptations such as increased um, thickening of the left ventricle in the heart, so it's able to pump blood, uh, more blood, okay, with, with increasing the ejection fraction and also increasing the size of the heart and the strength of the heart. Um, just remember that cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular training is the most important because nobody ever died of a weak bicep. Yeah, so moving on. We focus on the dosage, which is um, the principle of overload. And now we're talking about cardiorespiratory overload. 
So we talked about overload with the muscles and muscular hypertrophy. Now we're talking about cardiac adaptations and cardiac uh, hypertrophy. The heart is a muscle. It will get stronger. And the lungs and the blood vessels need to increase their elasticity. Okay, Otherwise, they suffer from the principle of reversibility. If you don't use it, you will lose it. So the dosage is important. We remember that with the acronym DRIVE. The duration, how long is the activity, the rest or recovery. This could be resting between sets or days between that. The intensity of which we're working at and the volume. The volume is the overall sets and reps for that week, that month, that year. And then which energy system? We're talking about the aerobic energy system here. Aerobic means with oxygen. Um, so we're talking about uh, activity longer than four minutes. Um, that's what we're up to. So it's important to know our metrics. OK, so resting heart rate is roughly between 60 beats per minute and 80 beats per minute for the average Joe. OK, respiratory rate is roughly between 12 and 18 breaths per minute. Stroke volume, which is the amount of, uh, you know, effectively how often uh, the volume of uh, uh, per beat, okay, is normally about 70 millimeter, milliliters per beat. And then the cardiac output, okay, um, that's the stroke uh, volume and the heart rate together. So, you know, per minute, okay, going through the cardiovascular system is, is over five liters, okay, of, of heart um, and blood um, and all sorts of all sorts of fluids going around the body, being pumped um, around the body, which is a, a huge volume. So if we look at, you know, how much volume is going around the body uh, at all times, when you exercise, that's going to be triple or quadruple that. And then we've also got blood pressure. Blood pressure will rise accordingly. And we've got the rough one at 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury is our rough blood pressure. So they're the metrics that you need to know. Really important there. So Heart rate, 72 beats per minute, respiratory rate, 12, stroke volume, 70 milliliters, cardiac rehab, 5.25 liters per minute, and blood pressure, 120 over 80. Of importance are heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Stroke volume and cardiac rehab, um, a little bit more techy because they're harder to measure. So we can see that when we start exercising, the blood pressure will go up from this, you know, 120. OK, and that can rise pretty significantly. So the systolic blood pressure will rise significantly. Uh, the diastolic should only fluctuate just ever so slightly, and that should be fairly stable. OK, so if we've got um, blood pressure that goes over 200 milliliters of mercury or diastolic that goes over 100 millimeters of mercury, OK, then there is generally something, uh, generally an issue uh, unless we can return to homeostasis pretty quick. So just be aware of how blood pressure changes, only systolic rather than diastolic. And then obviously we've got the heart, um, which is effectively a muscular pump with four changes, chambers. We've got the, um, the, the, the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart. So we've got the atria at the top and then the ventricles at the bottom. We've got two systems that the heart runs effectively. So it pumps oxygenated blood to the body and the deoxygenated blood back to the lungs to get reoxygenated. Yeah. So blood in the pulmonary circulation um, will be um, will be getting oxygenated and blood in the systemic circulation will be being transported around um, the body. So obviously, if we're exercising those working muscles, um, are going to need oxygenation uh, via the aerobic system. So here we've got, um, no, okay, um, we've got a PowerPoint that actually works, um, but I can't show it here because uh, it won't let me play it. But there's an animation that shows this going round, and it gives you just a you know a diagram paints a thousand words. So effectively, we've got you know blood coming. Um, coming in, either getting oxygenated or going to the body because um, it's been oxygenated. So this dual pump system um, is happening 
um, you know, pretty much all the time. Your heart never stops beating. Um, if you do, it's, you're in trouble. And obviously the blood needs to get oxygenated to be pumped around the body. So the right side of, uh, of the heart is to do with collecting this deoxygenated blood, okay, via these, these two large veins, which is the superior and the inferior vena cava. And then the left side is about um, oxygenated blood and, and it's, it's uh, returning to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Okay, so we've got this dual system that's going on. It'd be easier to show you with, with, with diagrams, but I'm sure you get the picture. I'm sure you've done the heart to death in access courses um, and um, in A-levels and stuff like that. So this is just a kind of whistle-stop re uh, revision. But the first question is, have a little think of this, okay? Does the heart pump blood around the body? Is that statement true or false? A-levels were a long time ago, Charlotte. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so my question to you is, does the heart pump blood around the body? The entire body? And if it does, how does blood get back to the heart? So I'm going to give you a little, little minute to think about that one. Mark thinks it's false. What does everyone else think? Okay, so Charlotte's talking about the skeletal pump. We all think it's false. So why is it false? You know, you know the answer, but why? Type it in the chat, guys. Type it in the chat. Okay, so you, Mike's mentioning one-way valves. Yep, very good. Muscular contractions pump the blood back to the heart. Yep, Kieran's all over this. Okay, so it is the muscular pump that the, this is why it's so important to move. Okay, and sometimes the calves the gastrocnemius and the soleus are sometimes called the second heart because they pump the blood back up to the heart against gravity. Okay, so that's right. Um, there is a muscular contraction, a muscular pump. This is why exercise is so important to get the blood moving. I'm sure you've heard that expression before. Okay, so here we've got a nice diagram of the two parts of the heart, one oxygenating and um, oxygenating the blood. As soon as the blood's oxygenated, it then gets pumped around the body um, so everything can get the, the oxygen and the nutrients that they need. Okay, we've also got the lungs as well. So as we've got the airway open here, okay, we have the throat and it's the trachea that we're more interested in at the moment. Okay, that will bifurcate into the two lungs respectively. Okay, and that will go down to the bronchioles and eventually the alveoli. Okay, so if you're a smoker or you're living in a big city like a really smoggy city, for instance, like London, okay, then some of the alveoli are going to get blackened because you're breathing in pollution and, and dirt and soot and goodness knows what as well. Um, the same thing for smokers as well. Smoking because you're breathing in smoke, this sometimes can, can permanently blacken these alveoli. Okay, and then you've got little hairs on the bronchioles that, that are called cilia, and these kind of waft all the dust particles up, um, up um, to the trachea so you can spit them out. OK, um, that's why smokers cough in the morning to, to get all the, the tar from their lungs out and that sort of stuff. I'm sure none of you are naughty smokers, um, but your patients will be. OK, so the cardiovascular or the cardiorespiratory system has five um, things that it does. It's really important that we understand those five things. So basically, it's going to deliver oxygen to the working muscles. Yeah, working muscles need oxygen. Um, and also, we need to get, um, once they've used that, we need to get the deoxygenated blood back to the heart so it can pump it to the lungs to reoxygenate and it goes round and round and round. 
Um, we also, as a byproduct of exercise, we're going to create heat. Um, so we're going to effectively dilate a lot of our blood vessels uh, and uh, we're going to start sweating, which was the body's for, form of cooling itself, which is uh, an incredible feat um, saying that lots of animals can't sweat. OK, so sweating allows us to go out in the heat of the day, for example, um, because we can sweat and we can maintain our body temperature because of that. Um, obviously, the cardiorespiratory system is delivering nutrients and fuel to those tissues that are active during exercise. And we're talking about the transportation of hormones, uh, you know, adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline. Uh, cortisol will be the most common stress hormones that we might cover. And we do that next week when we talk about hormones. And all of these are going to increase the efficiency of which the cardiorespiratory and the cardiovascular system will work. So basically, the heart will get stronger. Um, it gets stronger by the left ventricle thickening, um, which is the most common. And it's also going to grow in size. We get hypertrophy of the heart. The blood vessels are going to increase their elasticity. The lung volume will hopefully increase slightly, particularly in the bases of the lungs, um, which is hard to get to. Uh, and we can clear um, some of this, um, some of this sort of dust particles and certain whatever else um, or from the alveolar by by coughing it out. So sometimes you get a, an exercise-induced cough um, as you're getting all the all the gunk and all the bad stuff off of the lungs. So when we're thinking about getting physical, um, the heart will have an anticipatory response. OK, we all know this feeling, you know, butterflies in your tummy. Your heart starts racing before you're about to do something crazy. I don't know, jump out of a plane or, or, or maybe do an exam. So you're going to have an anticipatory effect. Um, and this is the same for exercise. So on Monday, before you come into the session, you know that you're going to be exercising and there will be an elevation of your heart rate because of that. Um, and that's obviously um, through the system of systems, in particularly the hormonal system. And there's neurotransmitters, um, adrenaline and noradrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine. OK, uh, as they stimulate the body's um, system of fight or flight. So getting ready to fight like mad or run like mad. OK, uh, and that's the way that we've been designed. Um, so also we've got to think about, um, you know, how long can we maintain this very high heart rate before we reach something called steady state? So normally in a race, you know, there's a big sprint, say a running race, big sprint for the first minute, two minutes. And then everyone after they've switched from the, you know, the anaerobic system into the aerobic system, everyone reaches that steady state. OK, and then you want to be on that kind of threshold between the aerobic and the anaerobic if you're racing. But once you've reached steady state, you'll see everyone just kind of space out into their normal aerobic capacity. OK. So we've got to be thinking about increasing our heart rate. We've got to be thinking about increasing our stroke volume. And therefore, there's a joint increase of cardiac output. So cardiac output is uh, heart rate times the stroke volume. So what's the volume of blood that the heart is ejecting uh, and how many times a minute is it doing that? Uh, and then we're going to talk about the things like optimal training zones as well. Just give me a quick thumbs up in the chat. Just making sure you're not asleep. Everyone's still with me. OK, everyone understanding it. Quick thumbs up. Yeah. Are we still all OK? Yeah. Just making sure you're not busy checking social media or something. Good. OK, so we talked about the dual role of preventing and provoking, uh, and we provoke short term to prevent long term, just reinforcing that again and again. And that is, of course, the exercise paradox. OK, so our next one, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get two fingers. So your two fingers there, and I'd like you to take the radial pulse. OK on your left hand. The radial pulse will be on the thumb side. Yeah, remember it's on the thumb side. So find that pulse. And then once you've got the pulse, I'm going to time you for 30 seconds. OK, 
So I just grab my stopwatch. Okay, so everyone, finger on the, their pulse. Just listening to, into your pulse. Okay, we're going to do this for 30 seconds and then times it by two. So find your pulse. Three, two, one, start counting now. And stop there, and then multiply that number by two, and then put it in the chat for me. Multiply it by that number by two, and then put it in the chat. Okay, so we've got a real variety of heart rates there. Okay, real variety. So that is the easy version multiplying it by two after you've done it for 30 seconds. However, did you find that when your finger was on the pulse, you kind of think, oh, was uh, have I lost it? Have I got it again? So sometimes measuring for 30 seconds can be a bit inaccurate because you think, have I got it? Have I not got it? So what we're going to do now is we're going to do it for 15 seconds and then times it by four. And then you're going to see if that score is different to 30 seconds by two. Okay, so finger on the pulse. Finger on the pulse. 15 seconds. Three, two, one. Take pulse now. And stop there. Multiply that number by four and then type it in the chat for me. Okay. Looks like the heart rates are, are a bit lower on this one. It does look like the heart rates are a bit lower, apart from Emma, who's, who's obviously excited about something. But... Could you see the difference? <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Could you see the difference in the sense that 15 seconds is probably more accurate than 30 seconds? And you will probably get a lower heart rate at 15 seconds rather than 30 seconds because you're being more accurate. Does that seem, did everyone get a more accurate or a lower heart rate 15 seconds rather than 30 seconds? Or was it the other way around? You got high, Charlotte got higher. Okay. Yours was higher. Okay. Oh, interesting. Lewis was lower. Claire was higher. Grace was lower. So you can see that the, the taking of pulse is, is an interesting skill that we still need to be able to do. Okay. So I always take the, so even if I've got a patient in the hospital, I will come up, I'll look at the OBS and I'll have a look and see where it's done. All oh, right, fair enough, Claire. So Claire's multitasking. I don't, <laughs> I don't blame you then. Okay, so I always get, to, I always take a patient's pulse because it gives me that information about what's going on, and it's a skill I don't want to lose. So just be aware that you might be asked to do that in the exam. Okay, so let's have a look at your heart rates. So what I want you to do is determine your age, which you should know. And your heart rate that you got between, you can take the lower of the two scores if you like, and then type in the chat whether you're an athlete, excellent, good, above average, average, below average, or poor. Okay, type in the chat. Don't be shy. It's just a snapshot in time. So we've got excellent, excellent, good, average, below average. Okay, below average, above average, yeah. So we've got, okay, Kim's like that, athlete, thanks very much. Okay, Phil's like that, I've got excellent. So you can see that this is a snapshot in time, isn't it? So if I was, 
if I was to base this of just one one reading that you did on your own, how accurate would those results be? How reliable would they be? The answer is probably not very. But if you did the same thing for a month, all of a sudden your reliability would become much higher, wouldn't it? And you'd get have a cluster of data that you'd be able to refer to and give you some good averages. So you know if we wake up in the morning and your heart rate's at 90 and you're still in bed, it's likely to be that you could be unwell. Something to something to think about. Okay, so we're moving on now. So heart rate training zones. Um, hopefully there's no triathletes, um, but there probably will be. Um, you, you'll know about zones one, two, three, four, and five. Zone five being the red zone. We don't, we don't go into the red zone. That's maximal exercise. And zone one and two being very low level. So here we're going to do the classic 220 minus your age. Okay. And then what we do is we teach you the in-bar calculation when we do cardiac rehab because there's, there's some different things going on. But a nice, a nice 220 minus your age gives you a safe maximal heart rate where you're in the ballpark. OK, so if, for instance, you, you've got a 60 year old cardiac patient, what would their maximal heart rate be? Type it in the chat for me, please. What would their max heart rate be? It's 160. Yeah, perfect. OK, so now what I want you to do is work out your own maximal heart rate and type it in the chat. It is 220 minus your age. Let's find out what the maximal heart rates are. 190, 183, 201, 191, 180. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So you can see that most of you, let's have a look there. Most of you are at over 180 beats per minute. Okay. So most of you can train at 180 beats per minute. And that's your safe zone. Remember, you can go over that, over that, but normally we require um, some sort of athletic capacity. You've done that before, or you're used to doing that, that maximal heart rate. And that would be one of my uh, things as well when I'm advising people and they're taking up a high intensity sport like CrossFit. If they haven't taken their heart rate up to that high for a little while, it can be a you know, it can be a little bit dangerous. So we need a period of high load aerobic training so that they can, their heart can cope and recover um, rather than their head just think that they can do that. Um, a couple of you in the room will know what I mean. Um, so now you've found out your own maximum heart rate, we generally get people to train within 60 to 70% of their maximal heart rate, okay, which is much much sort of lower um, th than you think it is. So for instance, let's take me, okay, and let's pretend that I'm still 40, okay? Um, uh, you know, I was 40 once upon a time, okay? But just for the ease of calculation, if um, 220 minus 40 gives me 180 beats per minute, so my maximum heart rate would be 180 beats per minute, okay? So if I'm working at 60% of that, that's only 108 beats per minute, which isn't actually very much. And 75% of that is only 135 beats per minute. Okay, and that, that's the safe zone for me to train in. So if I go over 135 beats per minute, okay, that means um, that I'm going into the, uh, a zone of training where unless I'm, I'm quite an athlete, I won't be able to maintain that for too long. So what I want you to do is find out your maximum heart rate and then find out 60% of that and 75% of that and then type me in the chat your range. So I'll type my range in the chat. So it's 108, okay, to 135 beats per minute um, for Dale, okay? So that's my range, 60%, 75%. That's me. Have a quick go. Work out your own one uh, using percentages. So Claire's 109 to 137. Okay, 113 to 141. 
147 for Kieran, 141 for Lee, 151 for Isaac. Oh, you youngster, Isaac, you. Okay, Charlotte's 133. No, not years old, as in beats per minute. Okay. Who else? Come on, guys. Let's work it out. Okay, Lewis is at 141. Feds is at 143. Mike's 147. Oh, you're so young, Michael. So young. Okay, Mike's 145 and Helen's 144. Okay, so we get the picture. It's much lower than you think, isn't it? It is much lower than you think. Okay, so um, I, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of exercise videos. Okay, oh, thanks, Candice. I've been doing a lot of exercise videos, okay, because my girlfriend loves doing exercise videos. So we're doing Les Mills, um, Third Space, okay, um, lots of other stuff. And what I've noticed, Virgin Active, what I've noticed is that nobody seems to be performing a cool down. They come from this really high aerobic load straight into stretching, okay, which isn't a very good idea. And I'll tell you why that's not a good idea, particularly with your patients. It might be fine for young, fit people, but your patients will not be young and they will not be fit. And this rapid decrease of blood pressure can make them really lightheaded, okay? Um, and then, you know, they could be likely to pass out and black out uh, and fall over. Um, and we get something what we call blood pooling, particularly in the legs. So what happens is we've got, because the, the calf pump isn't working, we're not getting the blood back to the heart, you see. So we get this pooling of blood in the legs, okay? And, and sometimes you, you can get lightheadedness from this or, 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 even, or even black out, okay? Um, and then you've got to lie the person on the floor with their feet elevated because that will return the, the blood. The blood then goes back to the heart very quickly with the feet elevated, okay? Um, so, you know, I've got a story about this. When I was a student, we were doing something called the Wingate test. Okay, so the Wingate test is a maximal anaerobic test on a bike against a resistance. It's, it's a pretty challenging test. So what was happening is we were doing a protocol with no cool down. So we just get on the bike, pedal as fast as we can, as hard as we can for 30 seconds or a minute. And then we get off the bike and then someone to be else would be getting on. And the, the experimenter wasn't really interested in the health of, of their subjects. They just wanted to get the data. So what happens is after I'd cycled really hard, okay, I came off the bike and I blacked out. Okay, and I woke up on my back with my legs elevated, okay, because I hadn't done a cool down. Okay, and I was only young, I was only 19. Okay, and because of the maximal effort I'd, I'd put in, I created a lot of lactic acid. Okay, and I created blood pooling in the legs. All I had to do was get off the bike and march on the spot or walk round or just cycle on the bike for 30 seconds. That would have given me enough time to do that. So that highlights, okay, um, the importance of a cool down. And because obviously that happened to me, I, I'm very keen uh, on a cool down. Just out of interest, anyone else ever blacked out from exercise? No? Just me? Yep, Mike has. Well done. There's two of us. There's two of us there. Okay. So we've got to think about the lungs during activity. Okay. And obviously the, the lungs are providing energy. They're removing carbon dioxide and the waste products. Um, and also what happens is when we are, um, we can't have normal respiration when we're in high aerobic load or anaerobic load when we're trying to breathe in. So we begin to use what we call the accessory muscles, okay? Um, so we're using, okay, um, the muscles of the upper trapezius. Um, we're using uh, the levator scapulae as you get this kind of upper, upper traps respiratory rate. We'll obviously be using the internal and external obliques. We'll be using the abdominals as we're just trying to just breathe as much as we can um, and, and trying to take in uh, extra volume. Um, and also, we're going to have to think about when we when we're working hard, our breathing becomes more shallow. OK, so we have to train people to try and breathe as deep as they can. And there's something called the VO2 max. 
Okay, and this is what we call the maximum oxygen uptake. So what is your efficiency for using oxygen? And this is normally determined by the horrible bleep test. Okay, so the VO2 max test or the bleep test, just type yes in the chat if you've ever experienced the horror of the bleep test. Yeah, most, most people have done this. Absolutely hideous. Absolutely hideous. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, and the bleep test is one of those things that's testing. It's more a test of motivation, really. But it's testing, you know, how long can you keep going? Uh, and it tests the maximal oxygen uptake. Okay. And obviously, you're going to get an increase in your breathing rate, probably from about 12 respiratory rates per, per minute. And you could be up at 20, 22, 25, okay, but you're really sucking in the air, okay, and you tend to breathe through your mouth because you're desperate to suck in that air, okay, uh, because you need that oxygen as well. So just horrible reminders of the bleep test there. Um, so how do we measure effort? So we've got a maximal test like the bleep test, um, uh, but we don't do maximal tests with our patients really, simply because they're unwell. And it would be not very sensible um, to make unwell people do maximal tests. It would be a bit cruel. Um, so we're going to measure things like heart rate. We can measure heart rate during the session. We give them like a like a chest strap to put on, okay, and a watch. Or um, when I worked in London, there was something we could have them all on the computer up on the wall, so we could see how hard people were working, and they had to be within their zone. Obviously, we can look at the breath. If someone's increased their work of breathing significantly, they're using those accessory muscles. They're working too hard. We can just have a look at them. You can tell someone that's working too hard, can't you? Yeah. And then we've got two scales that we use. Now, remember these. These are important. So we've got the rate of perceived exertion. OK, the RPE. And that's normally on a scale between zero and 10. And then we've got the Borg scale which is a scale between 6 and 20. So you've got two scales that we use. Okay, the Borg scales tend to be used in the scientific literature. We could also use things like blood pressure and METs as well, metabolic equivalent of tasks. Just put a yes in the chat or a thumbs up in the chat if you've heard of METs before. Metabolic equivalent of task. No one. St stunned silence. Okay, a few of you have. A few of you have. Okay. Right. Okay, so this is the Borg scale. Now, six is no exertion at all, like just like you're walking along, casual Sunday stroll. And then 20 would be maximal exertion, sprinting flat out or cycling flat out or doing whatever on the rower flat out. So we want to be working somewhat hard, which is about 13. So between 12 and 14. That's where our patients want to be. So what happens is while our patients are busy working out in the class, we come around with a card with the Borg scale or the rate of perceived exertion scale and say, how hard are you working? And they say, oh, probably about 12 or probably about 15. If they're 15, they're working too hard. If they're 11, they're not working hard enough. So we need to create that overload. If we don't create that overload, we're not creating the training effect. And if we overload them too much, we could be doing them a mischief. So remember that 12 to 14 or 13, somewhat hard on the Borg scale. Uh, that's where we want to be exercising. And then we've got rate of perceived exertion chart 1 to 10. OK, so 1 being very light activity, 2 to 3 being lighter activity, 4 to 6 moderate activity, um, 7 to 8 vigorous activity, 9 or 10 um, th these are when you're getting really into hard uh, training. So here's what I talked about when we when I said the zones. So zone one and zone two, okay, this has been known to triathletes, is this is where they spend a lot of their time, okay? So they are below 75% of their maximal heart rate. That's important. And then we've got moderate activity. Now we can stay in this zone. OK, and that's really the zone we want to be staying in. Now, if we go into this next zone, we go into zone four. OK, this is what we call our anaerobic threshold. This is where you're training so hard that your your aerobic system is almost giving in to the anaerobic system. 
okay? And you can't sustain the anaerobic system for very long at all. We can stay in this zone all day. This is called the tempo zone, okay? That's the training effect. Most people will be in this zone, zone two, where they can go all day. Um, athletes will be in this zone. If we go to red uh, to um, zone four or even zone five, okay, we're just going to be we're, – we're over 80% of our maximal heart rate, we will not be able to sustain that for very long unless you're an Olympic athlete. Okay, so this is where the athletes hang out between zone four and zone three. Okay, the endurance athletes I'm talking about, the aerobic monsters. Okay, so if I was to say um, on the Borg scale, where do we want to be working on the Borg scale? Type it in the chat, guys. Exactly. So 12 to 14 on the Borg scale. Now, when we're working in the class, okay, on the rate of perceived exertion, we probably want to be working at four to six, zone three. Okay. This is moderate activity. Do you remember, you know, 150, 150 minutes of moderate activity? Does that make sense? Okay. So we want people we want our patients up in zone three, but a lot of them can't get there initially. So we've got to start them low. You lower your expectations, but ideally we want them up in zone three, which is moderate activity. Remember, we can do 150 minutes of moderate activity, or we can do 75 minutes of vigorous activity. Okay. So when we say, you know, what's moderate activity? That's four to six on the rate of perceived exertion. Vigorous activity will be seven to eight or in terms of um, the rate of perceived exertion. Okay, everyone happy that? Give me a thumbs up in the chat that you're happy with the Borg scale, six to 20 and rate of perceived exertion, uh, one to 10. Just give me a quick thumbs up that we're all good. Fantastic. Okay. So now we're going to come on to something called METS. So metabolic equivalent of task. So we've got our, our resting metabolism. Uh, and then what we want is a percentage of our resting metabolism um, that the activity is created from. So, for example, we're never at zero METs because our, just to stay alive, we're burning energy. So even when we're sleeping, we're, 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 we're roughly about one MET. So just lying down and doing nothing the metabolic equivalent of task is about one. Okay, so this is all the physiological expressions that are going on, like your heart pumping, um, the brain activity, what's going on with the internal organs, all that sort of stuff. Even at rest, we're burning one met. Okay, um, if you're sitting still, we're at about one and a half mets. Um, so one and a half METs would be uh, an example of just sitting still. So you can see that the majority of the Western world is sedentary in its behavior. And that's why people are putting weight uh, and not getting enough activity. Because sitting still only burns 1.5 METs. Now, if we go for a walk at lunchtime, okay, or after work, or we walk to work, okay, um, all of a sudden you could be burning up to three or four METs. Okay, so you've, you've quadrupled the amount of metabolic expenditure from sleeping, okay? And then if you could to go running at lunch or after work or before work, okay, then you could be burning eight times that. All of a sudden, you can see how easy it is to put on weight, you know, during lockdown, for example, when the majority of people aren't walking to work, aren't walking about, and they might only go for a walk at lunchtime because they've reduced their metabolic expenditure because they're not doing what they'd normally do because they're, you know, for example, the gyms are closed. Um, so well worth thinking about metabolic equivalence of task. So here we've got some examples. So watching TV um, and working behind a desk, all less than two, uh, two mets. And then if we're walking, we could go up to three or four mets. Doing some exercise, moderate activity is between three and a half, okay, and six mets. Okay, and then if we're going jogging, that's roughly seven, seven mets. 
maybe doing some, maybe doing a little body weight workout, eight METs. And then if we're running or even skipping, skipping in, is about 10 METs. Okay. If you're doing CrossFit, you're probably about, I don't know, 12 METs. So that gives you an example of the metabolic expenditure throughout, um, throughout uh, somebody's day. So if you look at our patients that are in hospital, um, sat by their beds or walking to the toilet, walking to the toilet might be the only exercise they get. Look at how low their metabolism is. So this is why we've got to get them to do exercise uh, and, and, and move more, not only for their cardiovascular health, but also for their metabolic health as well. So remember, it's a system of systems. This is why movement is so important. Okay. Um, right. Going to tell you now about high intensity interval training. This is also known as HIIT training. Um, so this is this is uh, this has revolutionised um, the way we start training. So those that are able to, we would like to train at a vigorous intensity because we only need half the amount of time for them to gain the benefits. We only need 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week to get all the benefits. That's only 11 minutes per day to get all these huge benefits. You get double the benefit than moderate activity. So this is why HIIT training became so popular, because you, you, you can get everything done in four minutes. Just imagine working out for four minutes, and that's all you need to do. You get all the health benefits. It sounds, it sounds like it can't be done. However, those four minutes are at maximal intensity. And you'll understand what that, what that is like on Monday when you do some Tabata training. So Tabata training is 20 seconds of intense work followed by a 10 second rest, which isn't enough time for you to recover. And then you go again and again and again, and you do that for four minutes. Okay. And then, then you lie in a big puddle of sweat, uh, knowing that you've worked out. So these are short, intense workouts. They get the heart rate up and the metabolism up high and fast, quickly. Uh, they are fantastic for your health as long as you are fit enough to do them. Okay, so this is an experienced person, somebody that's been training for a minimum of six to eight weeks before we'd even think about increasing the intensity. But just be aware, there's lots of research on high-intensity interval training or high intensity functional movement. Um, so just be aware of that. So if we think about what we've done, we've covered the, a little bit of revision around the heart, okay, and that's that dual pump system, okay? Remember the heart doesn't pump blood around the body, it pumps blood out, and it's the muscular pump that, that brings the, the pump, uh, that pumps the blood back. Just remember when I blacked out because I had blood pooling in my legs because I didn't do a cool down. And then I had to lie on my back, have my legs elevated, and the blood flowed back to my heart. Um, exertion can be measured in the form of resting pulse, exercise pulse. So we're measuring our pulse, okay, as, we, as we've done there. Um, we can also measure, measure blood pressure. And during the session, we could also use heart rate with a chest strap maybe. We could measure heart rate at the radial pulse but we're going to measure it using either rate of perceived exertion or using the Borg scale. Rate of perceived exertion, 1 to 10. Borg scale, 6 to 20. On the rate of perceived exertion, we want to be roughly about 5, okay, between 4 and 6. That's moderate activity. On the Borg scale, about 13, somewhat hard. Okay. Um, any questions before we go into Kahoot, guys? Any questions, type them in the chat for me. There's some terminology there. No questions. Right. Let me just find the Kahoot code for you. Give me a second. Let me just write down that code. Okay. I can't see the questions because I'm on a different screen at the moment. Just give me two seconds. Okay. So the code is nine zero three three seven seven eight nine zero three three seven seven eight i'll type it in the chat now okay neil hold that question um while i just type that okay yeah neil what's your question 
Just type it in the chat. I'll see if I can answer it for you, my friend. Yes, I'll talk about those right at the end, Neil, if that's okay. Yeah, so I like the fact that you're thinking about exams already, my friend. I, I, do, I do like the fact that you're thinking about exams already. Right, let me try and share my screen with you guys. There we go. Okay, so we've got some people coming in. Yeah, and, and just like if you've if Neil's got questions, I'm sure you, you guys have got questions as well um, about the up and coming vivers. Right, we'll just wait for a few more of you to get back in. And then we shall begin. Anyone else joining us? So we've got 20, 31 in the chat and only 25 on Kahoot. I'm waiting, guys. I'm waiting. Thank you. Lewis for joining us. Okay. And anyone else? Anyone joining in? 9033778. Okay. I don't think we're going to get any more for any more. Here we go. First question. Which one of the following is the correct answer for describing the exercise paradox? The majority of you getting that right. OK, so it provokes acute, not chronic, and prevents chronic. I tricked you there with that first one, didn't I? OK, got to read the question. So who's on top? Kieran's on top, then Laura, then Phil, then Jace, then Ruby. All to play for. We've got six questions. Which of the following best represents average blood pressure? Average blood pressure. Yes, easy, easy. 120 over 80. Phil's on top. Then Laura Kieran drops to third. Ruby and Lee, we welcome you to the leaderboard. Okay, question three. Which of the following best represents an average heart rate? Oh, catching some of you out there, it's 72 beats per minute. 72 beats per minute is the average heart rate. Who's on top? Phil, Lee moves up. Then Mike, Isaac, and Charlotte join the leaderboard. Welcome. Question four, which of the following best represents an average resting respiratory rate? OK, this one's a little bit tricky, isn't it? It's a little bit tricky, OK, because um, 12 is the average. 12 to 24 would be too much of a gap. Um, so I, 8 to 16 is actually the answer. I'm a bit cheeky with that one. I might revise that question. might be a bit too hard. Certainly called fill out. OK, Isaac goes top, then Kieran, Phil, um, CR, and then Lee. Question five, which of the following best represents a description of metabolic equivalent of task or met? There you go. The majority of you getting that nicely done. Oh, Kieran goes top, then CR, then Isaac, then Mike, then Jason. Last question, all to play for. 
The Borg scale for rate of perceived exertion is measured on what numerical scale? Oh, easy, easy. No problems there, guys. Okay, who's in third place? Claire, well done, Claire. Second place, Isaac. But our winner today is Kieran. Well done, Kieran. Round of applause. Our runners up are Neil and Phil. Well done, guys. Well done indeed. Absolutely fantastic. Very well done. Okay. Um, so um, Neil had some questions. I'm sure some of you have also got some questions about the case studies coming out for the Viva. Okay. So the Viva will be, your Viva will be on the 20, let's have a look, the 27th, 27th of May. Okay. So 27th of May. So I will release the case studies two months before that. So you've got two months to prepare. Okay. And you're you're only going to look at them the night before anyway, aren't you? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, but does that answer your question, guys?